Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is part of a new series that we are beginning called The Book of the Beginning, and this is lesson number two in that series entitled The Fall. Hmm, I wonder what that could be about. This is the lesson for April 9 of 2022, and as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come once again to <clears throat> open your word and to understand what's here. We think about these momentous things that happened back early in the history of our world. Help us to understand them more clearly and how we can learn from them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are two key verses in Genesis for us to consider this week. They are God's instruction to Adam in the Garden of Eden just after he formed Adam. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, Jim. He said to them, he said to him, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day, American Bible Society. Wow. Why was this serious warning given so early in the history of humanity? Was that really necessary? It seems clear that God intended for us to know good, but not to know evil. Did God give them any explanation of what he meant when he said, die? Well, there's another way of saying that, die. It says, die, die. Mm -hmm. I think we mean, you'll, you'll begin dying. Because mm -hmm. uh, obviously they didn't fall over dead, but their process of death began at that from, time. Well, from what we know about God, I'm sure he explained it to them. Maybe not in exactly terms that we know about. And one of the things that um, I found interesting in this lesson, there's a lots of explanation about the Hebrew words and phrases and so forth, which I understand, it's, but it's, it gets a little complicated. But of course, God wasn't speaking Hebrew to Adam and Eve anyway. It was just the Hebrew that Moses was talking about when he wrote it down. Well, and we're trans what we've got today is, is a, from a language that was dead uh, when they left Babylon. They, mm -hmm. it, it, yep. it, so we've got, what, two and a half millenniums since that time and, and try to reconstruct it. Uh, yeah. It's a real, real serious problem. They were to eat of the tree of life every day. But after taking the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they not only suffered the consequences, which were and are death, but also they were excluded from the Garden of Eden, never to be able to approach the tree of life again until a long time from now. Yeah. What happened in God's universe before Adam and Eve were created? When did sin first occur in God's universe? What are the other terms used for Satan? Gary? I'm reading from Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Now I'm going to interrupt for just a second. There's four names for him there. What are the four names? Devil, Satan, Deceiver. Dragon. Dragon. And Dragon. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, if you want to include Deceiver, that's five, isn't it? Okay. That deceived, uh, well, let me repeat that. And that, the term Dragon, to, in today's Who's, who's the symbol of a dragon yeah. is China. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, they want to <laughs> control the masses. Yeah. I'll start again on that section. The ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Then I heard a voice, a loud voice in heaven saying, now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. It's from the Good News Bible. That oh. deceived the whole world. Now what, what portion is that referring to? 
What portion of the world? Well, it says the whole world. Is, yeah. it, is, it, is it just a just a fraction of it? Or is it uh, well the whole? When he when he deceived Adam, plain. when he deceived Adam and Eve, that was the whole world at that time, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's, is it is it? Then he gone to sleep since that since no, that no, time? No, it's, certainly it's, not. It's pretty active, is it not? No, there's. I'm. Uh, you guys are all angels. I know that, but you know uh, we know for sure from the Bible that there aren't any non sinners in our world. Well, uh, angels just means messenger. Yeah, I'm, I'm just so. joking. <laughs> we have the wrong messenger. In fact, we, the, the last lesson we had, uh, what, what about those that uh, make misrepresent God? Yeah. Are they, are they included those liars in Revelation and, yeah. and so forth? Now let's turn our attention back to the Garden of Eden with the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the snake or serpent. Genesis 3, verse 1. Duane, I think that's yours. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? Now, I'm just going to notice, pass it along here. The way he has phrased, of course, it's in English now, so I don't, I don't know Hebrew, and I don't know what language he, they were speaking at that time, but he's saying, God really tell you not to eat from any tree in the garden. He's implying that God has forbidden you from eating from any tree. Okay? It's very important to notice that the biblical writers identified that ancient serpent or snake of Revelation, no doubt, the same one spoken about in Genesis 3, with the devil or Satan. The ancient serpent, that was the one at the tree. And his work was always deception. In Hebrew, a sentence begins by mentioning the most important word. In this case, the serpent or the snake. The fact that he is called the serpent with the definite article the indicates that he was already a well-known figure. So they don't use definite articles in the Greek nearly so often as we do. And so when they do, if you put the article there, it means that's the one we've already spoken about. You know who I'm talking about. We should know about him already from his rebellion in heaven prior to the encounter in Eden. Notice these words from Ellen White regarding the snake or serpent. In order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. The serpent, now think about we, I on my run this morning, uh, round through the hills, around behind Loma Linda, I saw two tiny little garter snakes that's not what we're talking about here, okay? The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings, and while flying through the air presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. Now, question for you. Are we going to have serpents like that when we get to heaven? Why would we? They'll be there, I'm sure. Resting in the rich laden branches of the forbidden tree and regaling itself with the delicious fruit, it was an object to arrest the attention and delight the eye of the beholder. Thus in the garden of peace lurked the destroyer, watching for his prey. Patriarchs of Prophets, Ellen White, page 53, paragraph 4. Satan is clearly a real being. He's not just some kind of metaphorical personification of evil. And you... If you've had a lot of contact with other people with different, from different persuasions, different churches and so forth, you will, you'll get the impression from a lot of them that, well, Satan is just a, a, a word we use to describe evil, sort of, you know. And when Satan addressed Eve, he certainly did not want her to think that he was God's enemy. He even quoted God's words, but in a deceptive manner with only a partial quotation of God, leaving out the portion that meant the opposite of what Satan Im implied. He also did that much later, even to Jesus Christ himself, as recorded in Matthew 4, 6. Let me just show you that. And said to him, you, if you are God's son, if you are God's son, this is Satan speaking to Christ. Throw yourself down from, for the scripture says, God will give orders to his angels about you. They will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. And what did he leave out? Remember? God will, God will, uh, will give his angels, 
give order to his angels about you. They will hold you up with their hands. I'm sorry. God will give orders to his angels about you to keep you in all his ways. They will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet would be hurt on the stones. He didn't like the, to keep you in all his ways and he left that part out. Jesus answered, but the scripture also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The, the, the important there because deception is you, sit, you give them a good dose of, like if you want to poison a dog, you give a nice hunk of meat, but you stick the poison inside. You make yeah. it palatable. Yeah. Uh, you sugarcoat the pill so that it's right. easier to get uh, swallow. Yeah. In fact, a, 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 the other day I saw a quotation from a world famous atheist, Mark Twain. It's easier to fool a person than it is to convince him that he's been fooled. Yeah. Well, you could, I think that that's applicable to, to deception. Yeah. You, it's, it's easier to deceive than it is to convince them that they have been deceived. Yeah. Well, Jesus answered, Jesus answered, but the scripture also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their greatness and so forth. Um, when, she, when she approached that tree, Eve knew that she was making two mistakes. One, she had wandered away from Adam. Two, she was approaching the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which they had been forbidden to approach. Now, she, she probably thought, well, they, you know, it's, it's just a tree. It's not going to hurt me. The serpent, really Satan, used a very clever technique to get the woman's attention. He started with a question. As we read earlier, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the snake was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? There was no lie there, but it was done in a to probably a tone of voice that was deceptive. And implying that, that, implying that God is for, here's this beautiful garden and you can't eat from any of the trees? Why do you think Satan started his conversation with Eve by asking her about her interpretation of God's words? To Eve, it probably seemed like an innocent question. Notice that the implication of Satan's statement is that God had forbidden them to eat from any tree in the garden. This immediately implied that Eve needed to respond saying, no, 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 we can eat of any tree in the garden except that one tree. If Satan was able to deceive Eve in the garden while she was daily speaking with God and with heavenly angels, how good is he at deceiving us? Whoa. Okay, was Satan trying to imply to Eve that perhaps she had misunderstood God's instructions? What do you think he was trying to imply here? Well, the God doesn't want them to really enjoy the, all their surroundings, yeah. probably. It, it's, yeah. uh, it, uh, a question, if they plant a seed there and... and he, God, God is... God, well, we're going to talk about it in a moment. But God is trying to keep you away from something, yeah. and He has lied to you to accomplish that. Yeah, withholding something from you that... Would be really good for you. Yes. Satan wanted to imply well, that... And, and he's probably, it was demonstrating, he was probably eating, eating some yeah, of it. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. So, yeah, that's look, the same picture. Yes, yeah. it's perfectly yeah. obvious, no? Satan wanted to imply that God was withholding almost everything from them. Eve's response, of course, told the truth that God was very generous, offering, their every, offering them everything except that one tree. Do you think Eve really thought that eating from that tree would give her more wisdom? He probably did. She really did. And he did give her wisdom. Uh, well, she wisdom. That she no, was... More knowledge, anyway. Yeah. Not How not often? Wisdom, knowledge. Yeah. yeah. How often today are we tempted to explore avenues of knowledge that might be just as dangerous? Today we usually regard knowledge as desirable. That's why many people spend many years getting an education. But are there some kinds of knowledge that, that are not good? Think of this story of Adam and Eve. The real issue is whether sin is dangerous, even deadly or not. Satan does not want us to believe that all the lies and temptations he promotes are deadly. Or maybe we would become wise and stop listening to him. 
How did the conversation between Eve and the serpent continue? Jim, I think that's yours, or is it Carrie? I think it's Carrie. Oh. Where are I? Genesis 3. Okay. <laughs> Genesis 3, 2 to 5. We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, except the tree in the middle of it. God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. That's from the Good News Bible. Now, if we go back, if we go back at that time, any, there's no, no record that any intelligent creatures had died up from, for that for that time. There was so uh, past performance is you know they say as a, uh, as a prediction disclaimer, of future. Yeah, yeah not a, past performance is not any indicator of future results. Yeah. But in this particular, there's been no evidence that God had threatened anybody to, to, no. with death. And then nobody, then nobody, intelligent creatures have seen any death. So, you know, from, based on past performance, he was not telling telling the lie. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, Satan ha t Satan's two main accusations against God, voiced even were voiced to Eve, were one, God is not telling you the truth. That is, God is a liar. Genesis three four, and two, contrary to what God has claimed, sin is not deadly. Now, do we believe that or not? Not at all. Satan did not want her to think about these issues, so he suggested that by eating the food, she could become like God. He said, let's, let's not talk about that. But he, but he admits that right there. He already admits in Genesis 3, 4, good and evil. Good and bad. Okay? Well, wait, he said that, but yeah. they're, they're, they're the evil. They probably be educated as to what evil. I'm talking about the heavenly intelligences mm -hmm. uh, knew what evil was, but nobody died. Yeah. In fact, in the biblical record, I think there's only two places, which is Psalms 82, what seven, and Jeremiah 10:11, when he's talking to these gods, the El Elohim, that they're going to die, like like. Mm -hmm. uh, like men. Well, yeah, people are referred to in some places as, yeah, well, as Elohim. Psalms 82, verse 7, uh, you uh, gods are going to die like Elohim, or like men. And then uh, Jeremiah 10, 11 says, you gods that are not the creator will die like men. And who wouldn't want to be like God? Notice that in the chiasm below, we'll see that in a moment, the central point, the most important point of all, focused on the messianic prophecy. The entire chapter was designed to get our focus on that point. However, keep in mind that Moses did not write chapters. The idea of chapters for the Bible was not conceived until long after Jesus' time even. Mm -hmm. How should Eve have responded to the snake and his offerings? Couldn't Eve have said, now this is what she should have said, this tree and this fruit have been here every day that I have. If this fruit is such a good idea, a good deal, I will come back tomorrow and have some, have some after discussing it with Adam and with God. But Satan was a good salesman closing the deal on the spot. They don't want you to walk off the lot. They want, you need to do this right now, right? Why did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden so close to the tree of life? Was that fair to Adam and Eve and, or unfair to Satan? Okay, I think, I think Dwayne. Dwayne. I don't know. It is because humans have taken the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because they disobeyed God, that they lost access to the tree of life and could not live forever, at least in this condition. This connection underlies a profound principle. Moral and spiritual choices have an impact on biological life. As Solomon instructed his son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. From our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday, April 8. Couldn't God have put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in a far corner of the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve would rarely go instead of in the center near the tree of life where they had to go each 
uh, each day to get to the tree of life? Or did God need to show the universe that he is fair by giving Satan a chance to approach Adam and Eve with his arguments against God? Does God have to be fair? Well, the one that argues about fairness, remember, is, is the Satan. Yeah. He says, it's not fair that you do, do for all these people, we offer them uh, a new life. Uh, what have you done for us? Yeah. Well, we're going we're gonna to see a very interesting quotation about that in just a moment. It is important to recognize that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was actually supposed to be a protection for Adam and Eve. Satan could only approach them at that one location. He could not follow them around the garden. Okay, who's, in, I guess that's me. You Satan. know, that, that's how God operates, though. He, he permits all, that's freedom, that is love. Without freedom, you don't have love, and God is love. And so all ideas are on the table. Mm -hmm. But there's only one way that has eternal life. Yeah. But you ha ultimately, you will make a decision. You will make a judgment call. You will make a separation between one way of life or, or a way that leads to death. Yeah. Quoting, quoting now from Ellen White, Patriarchs of Proverbs 53.3, very important passage. Satan was not to follow them with continual temptations. He could have access to them only at the forbidden tree. Should they attempt to investigate his nature, they would be exposed to his wiles. And that's what happened. They were admonished to give careful heed to the warning which God had sent them and to be content with the instruction which he had seen fit to impart. So what's happening here? It wasn't a, so often we teach that the, the tree was put in there as a test. No, it wasn't put there. It was supposed to be a protection. They were supposed to know to stay away from this tree. It's not a good place. But if you came up to the tree, then it becomes a test. But if you stay away from the tree, it's a protection. The only th yeah, go ahead. Not, not to lengthen the argument with conjecture, but w we proceed knowing that, well, Eve was deceived. Mm -hmm. But what if, what if it had been Adam by himself? Yeah. Would, would it, would, That's what would, the result, would the results have been any different? That's what is called sanctified speculation yeah. <laughs> in some circles. Well, I will, I will tell you that um, Martin Luther wrote a lengthy right. introduction to the book of Genesis. And he says, if Adam had been there instead of Eve, he would have said no. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, now, now I know the answer. <laughs> At you least, have an answer. <laughs> you, you have an answer, a, a la Martin Luther. <laughs> The only thing that Adam and Eve had to do to prevent her ever falling into evil was for them to stay away from that tree. And that was God's instructions to them. Why did God, God call to Adam and Eve in the garden saying, where are you? Now we're post the, the temptation. Of course, God knew where they were. He was giving Adam and Eve an opportunity to recognize their guilt and to ask for repentance and forgiveness. God was already working for their salvation and redemption. It is interesting to note that God had a similar question for Cain. Where is your brother Abel, right? Mm -hmm. And others in the Bible. This is anthropomorphism. Do you know what anthropomorphism is? <laughs> Anthropos is the Greek word for human beings, male or female. Morph is a it means the form of something. So anthropomorphism means suggesting that God has the same kinds of limitations that we have, that he's like us. Anthropomorphism, that God is like us. Other examples of this progression are seen in the story of Cain, Genesis 4, 9 to 10, and the flood. Remember? God saw how evil things were. The Tower of Babel. He saw the trouble there, and so he, he mixed up the languages. Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18. I'm going to go down to see if things are really as bad down there as, as, as it's reported to me, you know? These are, these are anthropomorphisms. God never pronounces judgment on us without giving us an opportunity to respond. God never condemns human beings without giving us or them an opportunity to respond, but we must be willing to admit our guilt if we are guilty. 
So who is more guilty, Eve or Adam? Jim, yes. I, <laughs> yes, okay. Jim, I think that's yours. First Timothy 2, verses 14 and 15. And it was not Adam who was deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and broke the, God's law. But a woman will be saved through having children if she perseveres in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Good News Bible. 2 Corinthians 11, verse one, 3. I am afraid that your minds will be corrupted and that you will abandon your faith, full and pure devotion to Christ in the same way that Eve was deceived by the snake's clever lies. Good News Bible. Okay. So we know what happened next, don't we? Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. Why did Adam and Eve immediately, I mean, where did they learn that idea? It must be. <laughs> I don't know if it's programmed in, but it's somehow sure, sure. They immediately try to cast the blame on someone other than themselves. The word translated deceive that Eve used implies that she thought, now we're talking about Hebrew now, we don't know what language she was actually speaking, but the word where it's described in the Bible using Hebrew implies that she thought, being deceived, she was doing the right thing. And there's some examples, 2 Kings 19.10, Isaiah 37.10, Jeremiah 49, uh, verse 16. I guess we have time to read at least 2 Kings 19.10 to say to him, the God you are trusting in has told you that you will not fall into my hands. Now this is, this is Sennacherib when he comes to attack Jerusalem. And he says, you know that we're powerful and we're strong and there's nothing you can do to, and that God you worship, he's not, he can't do anything for you. So here he says, the God you are trusting in has told you that you will not fall into my hands. But don't let that deceive you. You've heard what an Assyrian emperor does to any country he decides to destroy. Do you think you could escape? My ancestors destroyed the cities of Goza and Haran and Rezeph and killed the people of Beth Eden who lived in Telassar. And none of their gods could save them. Where are the kings of the cities of Hamath, Arpad, Sepharbaim, Hena, and Iva? So in other words, your God can't possibly do anything to protect you. Well, now, Adam blames the woman, saying that she gave him the fruit. There's some truth to this. And I guess I should have let one of you read this. And Eve blames the serpent, saying he <coughs> deceived her. There's some truth to this, too. But in the end, they were both, they both were guilty from our Bible study guide for Tuesday, April 5. And what was all this experience for? Wasn't it to tell, teach the heavenly intelligences? Well, Hopefully they learned see. something. Yeah. When trying to avoid blame, it is very common for people to mention some truth mixed with some error. That was Satan's original scheme. Let us now turn to review a part of God's plan for healing for Adam and Eve and the whole human race. God was being very direct with Adam and Eve. I think you, it's probably my turn. Yeah. Uh, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. Then the Lord God said to the snake, You will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear this curse. From now on you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust as long as you live. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. And he said to the woman, I will increase your trouble in pregnancy and your pain in giving birth. In spite of this, you will still have desire for your husband, yet you will be subject to him. And he said to the man, you listened to your wife and ate the fruit which I told you not to eat. Because of what you have done, the ground will be under curse. You will have to work hard all your life to make it produce enough food for you. It will produce weeds and thorns, and you will have to eat wild plants. Now, let me interrupt there. You uh, notice if you paid careful attention here that two things have been cursed, the serpent uh -huh. and the ground. Oh, yes. And then it says you, it, it will produce weeds and thorns, and you will have to eat wild plants. And that was the introduction to vegetables. 
Okay. okay, go ahead. You will have to work hard and sweat to make the soil produce anything until you go back to the soil from which you were formed. You were made from soil and you will become soil again. That's from the Good News Bible. Yeah, that's a better translation than dust. Yeah. Notice especially yeah. that God first condemned the serpent, but then almost immediately in the next verse, he offered hope to Adam and Eve involving a Messiah. And they have Genesis 3.15 in quotes there. That verse is the only positive one in the entire chapter. God had said that each of the things he had created during creation week was good. Eve's mind was focused on that tree, and she said the fruit looked good. Okay, go ahead, Duane. You can pick the next one up there. These two temptations, those of being immoral, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> those of being immortal and of being like God, are at the root of the idea of immortality in ancient Egypt and Greek religions. The desire for immortality, which they believed was a divine attribute, obliged these people to seek divine status as well in order they hoped to acquire immortality. Surreptitiously, this way of thinking infiltrated Jewish Christian cultures and has given birth to the belief in the immortality of the soul, which exists even today in many churches, resulting in the doctrine of eternally burning hell. Now, why does that result in the doctrine of eternally burning hell? But you don't die, and God's going to give blessings. If you can't to die, then what's God going to do? Well, he's given good things to the good guys. What are you going to do to the bad dudes? Yeah. I mean, that's a limited yeah. understanding there. But. Okay, so now let's, let's look at this um, thing here in, 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 de in depth. We're going we're gonna to struggle through this a little bit. Genesis 3, 14 and 15. We've, we've read it already, but let's look at it again. Then the Lord said, God said to the snake, you will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear this curse. So there's the first curse. From now on, you will crawl on your belly and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. We reach here a kind of reversal of creation. While creation led to life, the appreciation of good and blessings, judgment leads to death, evil, and curses, but also to the hope and promise of salvation from the Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, April 6. There's some very interesting parallels between Genesis 3.15, which we just read, and Revelation 12.17. Now, what do we know about Revelation 12.17? It's the talking about the dragon who is very angry because he hasn't succeeded in wiping out all of God's people. Anyway, um, Jim, you want to take that one? The dragon, that is the serpent, enraged, uh, it got, became enmity with enmity, and seed, that is offspring, and the women in Eden, and the women in Revelation 12, 17. The battle, that is the great controversy, that moved to Eden with the fall will continue to the end of time. However, the promise of Satan's defeat already was given in Eden, so that his head will be crushed, a theme more explicitly revealed in Revelation, which depicts his final demise, Revelation 20, verse 10. This is, right from the start, Humanity was given hope that there would will be a way out of this terrible mess that came from the knowledge of evil, a hope that we all can share in right now, but from the Bible okay. study guide. However, we go look back when the serpent says, "You will be like God or mm -hmm. like the gods, knowing good and evil." He mm -hmm. was not lying. Mm -hmm. That is not a yeah. lie. No. And and uh, so he he didn't he didn't well, he was. The deception wasn't yeah. all that much. There was something that started probably in, in Eve's mind. Wonder what this thing is. Because sin, doesn't it start right here? Yeah. Yeah, and it does. Right between the frontal bone, right? Yeah. <laughs> mm. It is important to notice that no sooner had God pronounced a sentence on human beings than he promised them salvation. But the consequences of sin were unavoidable. You know, God can forgive us, 
but you may still you may still have to face the consequences. Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, never to have access again to the tree of life until they see it in heaven. It is interesting to notice that having been given the death sentence because of their behavior, God told them that Eve would be able to give birth, Genesis 3.20, the hope of new life. In many places in the Bible, there are logical constructs known as chiasms. They begin with a certain point and progress down to a central main focus and then retreat back to the point from which they started. Notice the following interesting chiasm in Genesis 3. Significantly, the first Messianic prophecy, Genesis 3, 14 and 15, which we read a few moments ago, is located exactly in the center of the structure of the chapter. So what's right in the center? Why is that important? Remember in this chiasm things that the Hebrews believed in, the most important point is right in the middle. Okay, so we see this. There's A, B, C, D, and then C prime, B prime, A prime going back out again. So let's look at that. In Genesis 3, 1 to 5, what do we see? The serpent talks to Eve. God is absent. Temptation to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and she does it. Genesis 3, 6 to 8, Adam and, Adam and Eve are talking, and they lose their clothing, so they have to find dress themselves in fig leaves. Genesis 3, 6, 9 through 13, God now is talking to Adam and Eve. And this is, you know, we always suggest that this is a judgment. He's saying, where are you? He's saying, this is a, he, he's trying to give them permission to admit their fault and, and, and recognize that God is willing to do something for them. And then, of course, that brings us to the God speaking to the serpent in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, which is a messianic prophecy. And then going back now, we see that Genesis 3, 16 through 19, God talks to Adam and Eve and he tells them about Eve is going to have trouble in pregnancy, Adam's going to have trouble uh, using the, digging the soil, right? Then in, in Genesis 3, 20 and 21, again, Adam and Eve together, and now what clothing are the, did God give them? It, it did, the fig leaves? No, he gave them skins, which are much better clothing. Um, and then Genesis 3, 22, 22 through 24, God alone, prohibition to eat from the tree of life. So God, after they've gone out of the garden, what does he do? Closes the gate, basically. But we're going to find out that it's a lot more detailed than that. So, hold on. We've got some good parts still coming here. The structure of the chapter highlights the two main themes. The theme of the temptation and the theme of salvation. Um, so, Christians have often pointed to Genesis 3.15 as a promise of a future Messiah. What is the basis for that interpretation? If you just read... Genesis, let's look at that back up Packy again real, well here, we can do it right here. Let's do it this. If you just read Genesis 3, 14 and 15, and make that, make that just a little bit larger so it'll be easier to read. Then the Lord God said to the snake, you will be punished for this, you alone are all, of all the animals must bear the, this curse. From now on you will crawl on your belly and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. But then the, ver the verse we're really focusing on right now is verse 15. I'll make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. Now, we with our Christian background, we have come to understand that that is a prediction of the coming of the Messiah, etc., right? Yeah. Haven't you always been taught that? Do you know what that's based on? Well, we're gonna look, we're gonna look at a very careful Hebrew explanation of how, what that's based on. It's gonna be a little bit complicated, so let's work on it. Now, what is meant by the word seed? Let's start with that first. This word should neither be understood in a collective sense, referring to humanity as a whole, or a single people, for example, Israel, for, uh, for Israel, nor in a particular sense, meaning a specific human individual. 
So the seed, it, it, it doesn't specify, it's, it's general. It is interesting to note that in the next line, the seed has been replaced by the personal pronoun he, which in Hebrew is who, H-U, which is the actual subject of the verb bruise. He shall bruise your head, shuf in, in Hebrew. Thus he receives a special emphasis in the structure of the paragraph and the syntax of the phrase. So we've already said that in Hebrew, the most important part of the sentence, you want to put that at the beginning, right? So here's this pronoun he, and it's right at the beginning. Uh, he receives a special emphasis in the structure of the paragraph and the syntax of the phrase. It appears at the, as the exact center of the strophe or section at the very moment when the poetic rhythm shifts from four beats to three. And so we can't, I wish we could all understand Hebrew and we could look at this, but the rhythm changes. It's been four beats and now it's into three, three beats. Another hint that this is the pivotal point of the whole, the whole thing, right? This rhythmic shift indicates that this pronoun is the hinge of the passage. Moreover, he is the first word in the phrase, thus giving an emphasis. Out of the 103 passages in which the Hebrew pronoun, pronoun who, or he, is translated in the Septuagint, in other words, now going from Hebrew to Greek, Genesis 3.15 is the only occurrence in which it does not agree with its immediate antecedent. See, normally you would go along and that's we do that in English. You talk about someone and then he, what, what's implied immediately? The one you've been talking about, right? He or she is the one you've been talking about. But all of a sudden here, he, it doesn't agree. Well, wh in what way does it not agree? Well, the, the Greek language has, what we don't have in English, different words that are male, female, and neuter, okay? So the Greek translators, the form of the pronoun autos refers neither to the woman, autos is Greek, uh, I mean it's Greek, and it's male, male singular, okay? Refers neither to the woman, it is not feminine, nor to the seed, it is not gender neutral. So whoever translated that realized that that who thing there didn't go with the seed which was up further above it, it goes with something else. Suf. This syntactical irregularity shows us that the translators had in mind a specific person, a man in real history, because it's a male, a singular male uh, form in the Greek. The Messiah, of course, we would believe. This, mess this messianic interpretation of Genesis 3.15 is even attested by the Hebrew Scriptures. One of the most eloquent testimonies of this view is found in Psalms 110. Well, what does it say in Psalms 110? Let's look at that. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right until I put your enemies under your foot. Okay? Now, what was, what was the Messiah, back in Genesis 3.15, what was the Messiah going to do to the serpent? It's Crush its head. Yeah. What does it say here? I will put your enemies under your feet. From Zion, the Lord will extend your royal powers, rule over your enemies. He says, on the day you fight your enemies, your people will volunteer, like the dew of early morning, your young men will come to you on the sacred hills. That's the background stuff. So the Lord made a solemn promise and will not take it back. You will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. Oh, okay. So his, this is the king of righteousness. And there's only one person who qualifies for that designation, right? But we've already seen, and again, if we were able to read Hebrew, we would be able to see that that, that put your enemies under your feet is exactly the same in, in Greek as he will crush your head. So, coming back here, I hope we'll see if we can figure this out. So someone writing Psalms 110, where the words of Genesis 3.15 reappear and are directly applicable to the Davidic Messiah. The words of the Psalm tell him, make your enemies, Psalms 110, verse one, are indeed a verbal repetition of the first words of the Genesis promise, I will put enmity. So that's from our adult teacher, Sabbath, 
Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, and what we're trying to do here is giving you a little lesson in Hebrew and Greek, actually, get both Hebrew and Greek here. So by comparing Genesis 3.15, let's look at it one more time, I will make you and the woman hate each other, her offspring and yours will always be our enemies, her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. Okay, look at Psalm 110, 6 and 7. He will pass judgment on the nations and fill the battlefield with corpses. He will defeat kings all over the earth. King will drink from the stream by the road and strengthened he will stand victorious. Okay, now not so obvious the parallels, but their parallels are very obvious in Hebrew, which is the only other reference in the entire Old Testament with the words related, related to crushing the head. But in Psalms 110, we notice something else. The Messiah, who was, to be, who was to come was to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. We should remember all about Melchizedek from our studies last quarter. More than that, this Messiah will end up seated at the right hand of God in heaven. No one else could fill, fulfill that prophecy except Jesus Christ, the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. So if we all understood Hebrew and we all understood Greek, we would see that there's a link from Genesis 3.15 to Psalms 110, in Psalms 110, we would see that this link comes to someone who's going to end up sitting at the right hand of God. He's going to be the, uh, a king, or he's going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek, and there's no question about it. There's no one else that could possibly qualify for that except Jesus himself, right? Yeah. That was a little, a little heavy, but I That's hope good. we... Huh? I like that. Yeah. So, um, okay, it's interesting to note God's actions after his encounter and conversation with Adam and Eve after their sin. Genesis 3.24. Um, where are we? I think this, Duane, I think this might be yours. Then at the east side of the garden, he put living creatures and a flaming sword which turned in all directions. This was to keep anyone from coming near the tree that gives life. And I will tell you something interesting. If you read carefully in Ellen White, she mentioned several places that, first of all, that Adam and Eve and their children came back to that gate to offer sacrifices. That's a place where they, this was the closest they could get to God. So they would came, came back there to ask for forgiveness, to offer their sacrifices, and so forth. But that's not all. She goes on to describe in one at least one place, I think a couple of places, that up until the time, well, first of all, she says, it was at the time of the flood that the Garden of Eden was removed from this earth and taken to heaven. So the Garden of Eden is up there. But she says, up to that time, those antediluvians were constantly trying to figure out some way, they, even the wicked ones, were trying to figure out some way they could get into the garden and get to the Tree of Life. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. So now, how does sin change us? Why were Adam and Eve who had been so comfortable with God in the past trying to hide from him? What does the Bible mean when it says that they realized that they were naked? Genesis 3, 7. Adam and Eve had placed themselves on the side of Satan in opposition to God's plan for their lives. So what were the immediate results? The following is a section compiled in the, the, the book, the compilation from Ellen White, The Truth About Angels. Notice these very interesting words. Holy angels were sent to drive out the disobedient pair from the garden, while other angels guarded the way to the tree of life. Each one of these mighty angels had in his right hand a glittering sword. So if Adam and Eve were outside the garden, what were the other holy angels guarding around the tree of life? What were they guarding against? Strong angels, another place. Strong angels was beams of light representing flaming swords turning in every direction were placed as sentinels to guard the way of the tree of life from the approach of Satan and the guilty prayer. Hmm. So think about it. You know, Satan knows that that tree gives life. His tree of knowledge of good and evil is close to that tree in the center part of the garden. So as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, Satan said, let me get to that yeah, tree. And they, and they were prevented. And there, he was prevented, and all these all evil angels were prevented. 
it was Satan's, and I hear so she spelled it, that was Revo and Herald, February 24, 1874, but it's also in this, this book, small book, The Truth About Angels. And I can tell you, I just recently um, listened to that book in audio format. It's an incredible book. If you haven't had a chance to see the book entitled The Truth About Angels, you really should get that book and, and read it. So now here's another part, another, this is, follows right on with that. It was Satan's studied plan that Adam and Eve should disobey God, this is what he, he wanted, receive his frown and then partake of the tree of life, that they might perpetuate a life of sin. But holy angels were sent to debar their way to the tree of life. Around these angels flame flashed beams of light on every side which had the appearance of glittering swords. So that tree of life, Adam and Eve couldn't get to it, and Satan and his angels could get to it. And that's what they, they all want, all of them wanted to get to it. Any comments or questions about that? Remember that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, by the way, that's not in our Bible study guide. Remember that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was in the center of the garden near the tree of life. Satan and whoever of his forces might have been at that tree of knowledge of good and evil, remember they were, they were confined to that tree, immediately tried to go over to the tree of life. But God's angels were already preventing anyone, even Satan, from approaching the tree of life. So what do we know about that covering that Adam and Eve wore in the beginning? Psalm 104, 1 and 2. Jim? Praise the Lord, my soul. O Lord, my God, how great are you, how great you are. You are clothed with majesty and glory. You are cover yourself with light. You have spread out the heavens like a tent. Okay, it's the covering that God wears. Okay, Ellen White suggests that a garment of light is also what the angels wear. What has been God's original, what had been God's original plan for the relationship between Eve and Adam? Going back now to the creation story. Carrie? Oh, sorry. Uh, what had been God's original plan for the relationship between Eve and Adam? When God created Eve, he designed that she should possess neither inferiority nor superiority to the man, but that in all things she should be his equal. Now, how do, how do we see that in thinking about from the, the biblical text? What, what tells us that she was supposed to be his equal? She was not at the head, she was not at the foot, she was taken from where? Yes. Rip A rib. Side. Right at his side, okay? Uh, where are we here? The holy, the holy pair were to have no interest independent of each other, and yet each had an individuality in thinking and acting. But after Eve's sin, as she was first in the transgression, the Lord told her that Adam should rule over her. Why do you think God said that? to reinforce what he just told her about. He was going to be a bummer, I well, guess. Well, it's clear that she was the one who first sinned and the first one who led into sin, so some that might be one reason. Yeah. Any other reasons you can think of? Well, men tend to be bigger and stronger than women. And suppose that God had made the woman to be the more powerful one, there might have been a problem. This is a possibility. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. But after Eve sinned, as she was first in the transgression, the Lord told her that Adam should rule over her. She was to be in subjection to her husband, and this was a part of the curse. In many cases, the curse has made a lot of women uh, very grievous and her life a burden. The superiority which God has given to man, he has abused in many respects by exercising arbitrary power. Yeah. Infinite, Think of all the times that we know about in the history of the world that that's happened. Infinite wisdom devised the plan of redemption which places the race on a second probation by giving them another trial. That's from Mrs. G. White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, 
481. She also says that redemption is education. Yeah. And education generally takes some time. Yep. Well, some people have suggested that women are inferior to men because the bone to make Eve was taken out of Adam. And when someone says that to me, I remind them that every male since that time has been taken out of women. Yeah. <laughs> Including you, whoever you are. Well, do we make the correct association between these passages in Genesis and what we read in the, la in the rest of the Bible? Um, we, in one of our previous lessons, we noted that if you reject the teachings of the first couple, two or three chapters of Genesis, and you say they're not really true, they're myth or something else like that, then you've got to deal with all the rest of Scripture where they clearly, even Jesus himself, implies that these stories are true. So if you, this is not just three chapters that happen to be at the beginning. These are foundational. These are really foundation to everything else. This is, and of course, it's the only explanation of where we came from. As we talked about in our previous lesson, the, 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 the ideas of evolution just don't fit. They just, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't hold water, really. Um, it's a poison to, to the thought process. Yeah. So, do we appreciate all that God has done for us? <laughs> Think about well, it. Just, most people don't. That's, yeah. And I, but do we can, that even a try, it, it, do we get, how close do we get? Yeah. Creation, redemption, forgiveness, life. Healing. God sustains us. He, he makes our bodies capable of healing themselves and so forth. Wow. They were created out of the dirt. He yeah. Created people out of out of dirt. The the, the refuse of the of the universe. Yeah. And well, be careful. My farmer friends wouldn't like to hear you calling dirt refuse. <laughs> well, it's still it, 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 it all refuse ends up in the dirt. So. Yeah, I understand because that's where we throw it. Have we become wise enough to distinguish between good and evil? That's really what we ought to be thinking about here. Because Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. He ate the fruit because Eve gave it to him. There's a lesson. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these very important lessons. May we come to learn more about you and appreciate you more fully because of what we have learned is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.